salvation. This is a call for salvation. If you do not know Jesus, this is a call for salvation. A call for salvation. Respond to the call for salvation. If you don't know the Savior, this is his presentation. It's been 2,000 years that has Hello, welcome to Voices in the Wilderness. I'm Reverend Maria. The Bible tells us that John the Baptist was a messenger, a voice in the wilderness calling to his generation to repent. Jesus also said to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repenting means to regret your sins, to change your way of thinking, and to change your conduct. Our own generation is in trouble. We too need to change our conduct and transform our minds. My guests, I have two very special guests today, Evangelist Bruce Vanetta and Evangelist Bruce Carlson. And they're here to tell us a very powerful story, a miraculous story actually, of God's supernatural healing. Now if you are interested in knowing the deeper things, the supernatural things of God, you need to listen to what they have to say. Welcome again. Well, thanks for having us on the show. Yes. And I know you um, don't believe in coincidences. You believe in divine appointments. And uh, the Lord connected both of you through a supernatural, miraculous healing. And we're going to talk about that. Mm -hmm. But before we do, I wonder if each of you could tell us a little bit about your own personal faith journey. Do you want to start with sure, Bruce? Sure. I'll, and I'll, I'll call you Bruce V and Bruce C. Okay. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so uh, my parents were people that believed in God, but we didn't attend church regularly. And I grew up in Wisconsin central Wisconsin. Ended up um, making a lot of bad choices, a lot of bad decisions in my younger years and knowing that there was a call in my life, knowing that God wanted me to uh, be a tool for Him but running the other way like Jonah did. Mm -hmm. And God kept sending different uh, people to speak to me and different people to try and uh, draw me in that direction and I kept running the other direction and then it was actually the accident in 2006 that we're going to talk about mm -hmm. that was the real turning, turning. point for me to go into ministry and been in ministry now for over seven years wow. and traveling around the world sharing in person 25 to 30,000 people a year in person maybe 170 or more times a year ministering mainly in North America but other countries as well but praise God praise God so it's been a long journey yeah, that's that's amazing well thank you for that thank I was raised in Westchester County New York and uh, had parents who wanted the best for us and they would drop us off at church while they did not attend. <laughs> so it was a bit of a double standard. But again, they wanted the best for my brother and I, so we went to Christians. I went to Christian schools and um, was always in the Christian setting for the wrong motivation or reason. So I tell people I didn't come into Christianity through the front door. I came through the Bilto, Bilko door, the basement door, you know. <laughs> but God did get a hold of me in that whole process. and. Uh, uh, wound up taking a call to Queens, New York, where uh, my wife and I were worship leaders and uh, teachers to begin with. So I've been in full-time ministry since 1970 and uh, took early retirement in 2009. I had met Bruce through this accident and uh, so the ministry just keeps going e even though, quote, I'm retired. Mm -hmm. As they say, uh, not retired, refired. Yeah, that's true. Oh, that's, so, uh, that's good. That's yeah. good. So it's, a, it's exciting, and it, I'm glad it's not letting up, you know. Yes, praise God, praise yeah. God. Now, um, Bruce, you were involved in this horrible, horrible accident mm -hmm. where a semi-truck actually fell on you, mm -hmm. and you had, I believe, like five major organs or arteries. some arteries, I'm sorry, arteries that were severed. Five places they were severed, yeah. Uh, take us back to that day. I had a... Uh, business where I traveled on the state of Wisconsin and I did on-site diesel engine repair and it was actually November of 2006 when the accident happened, November 16th exactly. It was a three-day job. I started the job on a Tuesday. The accident happened on Thursday night about 6, 15 p.m. Mm -hmm. I was called in to fix a coolant leak on this truck and I got to the end of the job, fixed the coolant leak. The truck wasn't totally back together but the technical part that I had been called in to do was done. And so the man that I was working with was the part-time mechanic slash driver at this logging company. Mm -hmm. He was my helper the whole job. Mm -hmm. 
got to the end as much as I was going to do, and I was wiping my tools off, putting them back in my truck. Just minutes from leaving, the guy comes up, taps me on the shoulder, and said, hey, before you go, I'd just like you to take a look at one more thing. And uh, for those people watching today, maybe if they've never looked underneath a big semi truck, if you were to look underneath the chrome bumper that's in the front, mm -hmm. looking towards the back of the truck, the lowest thing on the ground is the front axle. And the reason why is it's a dropped axle configuration. If you can imagine the two front wheels and the axle just drops down on both sides. So there's not much space mm -hmm. between the bottom of the axle and the ground. Mm -hmm. Depending mm -hmm. on the truck, it's not much. And so I, uh, the man had jacked up the truck and removed that front wheel and on the passenger side and there's about 10 to 12,000 pounds of weight. Wow. So five to six tons of weight on the two front wheels. That's not the weight of the whole truck, but just, just the weight on the two front wheels with the truck sitting there empty. And he had not used any safety equipment, no jack stands or blocking any type. He asked me to look at the, the oil leak, the dirty spot in the front of the engine. I saw that he didn't have it, um, it no, no safety equipment, but I thought, well, it's been on the jack for three days, engine's been running 15, 20 minutes. If it hadn't fallen off, you know, it's not gonna fall off. I thought it was safe, secure. I got on a creeper, a little tool that mechanics <laughs> used. I slid underneath the front bumper on my back, parallel with the center line of the truck, and ended up stopping with the axle, just happened to stop right above my midsection of my belly, basically across oh my Lord. belly button, mm. maybe just an inch above me. He oh. got up inside the truck, the truck shifted. Oh. When it did, I saw movement, the peripheral vision of my left eye, and I turned my head just in time to see the jack that's holding up this 10 to 12,000 pounds of weight shoot out, and wow. the axle fell through my body like a blunt guillotine oh and just crushed my body in half. When it hit on impact, so this, this 10, 12,000 pounds of weight hits the cement, and this wheel is still on, but that side was off, so it comes on and hits the cement. So it crushed me flat and on impact blood shot up from the inside of my body into my mouth and out and landed there and at that point I just called out to Jesus and said Lord help me I said it two times looked down on the left side of my body there was only about an inch of airspace oh my between gosh. the bottom of the axle and the cement so I know mm -hmm. that my body's an inch thick right, the creeper right. thank God it was a plastic hollow core creeper so it was just crushed flat oh my like, like to nothing basically no wheels in the middle or anything so it was just flattened out and so I looked to the right side and it was about two inches mm -hmm. of space. Mm -hmm. So I was, um, my vertebrae were broken, the width of the axle. So L4 and L5, I believe it were broken. So right in the middle, those two, they're just, just a little bit broken, but they were spider cracked, broken according to the radiology reports. Chafed into my spinal cord, my spinal column, just, a, just barely, just the sheath, just a mm -hmm. little bit. Um, so it's got me flat. I call out to Jesus, he gets out of the truck. He, I, he, he went into shock, he saw me, flat like that. Mm -hmm. We could only mm -hmm. see the top half of my body. The other half was on the other side of the axle. And the axle so tall, top to bottom. And when it fell through, this is all I could see. I couldn't oh see the lower half of my body as I'm laying under there. So I look at him. He's going into shock. And I, I begged him to call 911. Mm -hmm. I was mm -hmm. saying, please call 911. It seemed like forever, but I'm sure it wasn't. He mm -hmm. called 911. Uh, he, I begged him to shut the truck off because he never did shut the engine off at that point. And it's vibrating on me. Oh, my which goodness. Which made the, you know, just exaggerated the pain already. Right, right, right. So he shuts it off, then he goes and gets the jack. He can't put the jack underneath the axle because the axle's on the floor now. So he's trying to find a place to jack up the truck and to jack it off my body. Mm -hmm. So he, there's these two big leaf springs mm -hmm. that connect to the axle and it's a suspension. Yes. So he slides it underneath the leaf spring over here on my left, which you don't want to jack something up on a curve, but so I'm saying to him, don't jack it up there, but he did. He jacked it up off, the jack slipped just a little bit, but it caught on a bracket holding the leaves together. Mm -hmm. And then he jacked up off my body. And once he got up off my body, I was able to see my whole, you know, my whole body now that the axles lifted off of me again. And what I saw was as I, I looked down, my work uniform went to the edge of my ribs, went down, went flat along my spine, and oh came back my. up in my pelvic. And the only thing I could think is when I saw it was it that it looked like something out of a cartoon. <laughs> I mean, that sounds strange, but that's all I could think. Oh it was my goodness cartoonish like mm -hmm. when Wiley Coyote gets run over by Acme truck and he has a flat spot. Oh my that's, goodness. I mean that's the kind of you know mm -hmm. what I'm thinking. Yeah. The next thought was that there's no way I should be able to look at my body like this and be alive. Right, and right. And that I was probably going to die. I mean those are the kind of thoughts going through my mind. Sure. I'm starting to go into shock at this point already. Um, I started to beg him to get me off from the truck mm. and he didn't want to touch me, didn't want to move me. People have been, most people have been told you don't want to move someone with a broken back. And I'm flat, so he knows my back has to be broken. I'm surprised you were still able to talk during this it, time. You know, I couldn't talk with a lot of force. I okay. was, it was more, I yeah. could talk, but it was more of a very low mumble kind of mm -hmm. talk. Mm -hmm. And it, I was struggling to be able to communicate. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't, I realized he wasn't going to touch me. Right, right. So the big chrome bumper is back here behind my head. Right. And I reached back and grabbed the bottom of the chrome bumper. 
and drag myself out like this, wow. this far. So now this much of me is now sticking out from underneath the front of the truck. The rest of my body's underneath the truck. Oh Lord! And about that time, the very first responder is a volunteer fire department in rural area Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. He showed up, and then I, I believe the second one got there, and it was about that time. Um, because when the truck f had fallen on me, as you mentioned, I had five places mm -hmm. that major arteries were severed, and my spleen took a hit, pancreas took a hit, my intestines were really severely damaged, but I ended up bleeding out internally. Mm -hmm. So when I bled out internally, my heart stopped, and at the point that I lost my pulse and my heart stopped, my spirit left my body, mm -hmm. I went up under the roof of the garage, and I just watched the whole accident scene from above in perfect peace. Um, and I guess that's, that was the overriding thought or feeling, just amazing, amazing, perfect peace. Mm -hmm. So I just watched from above and I was watching people, what they were doing, and the guy that I've been working with felt really bad because he had jacked it up mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. um, he was on his knees above me, running his fingers to my hair, crying, apologizing. Sure. Sure. But the, the really supernaturally cool thing mm -hmm. is that on each side of him, mm -hmm. on each side of my body were two humongous angels. Wow. And he's about six foot one, six foot two, mm -hmm. on his knees. The angels were on their knees just like he was but their head stuck up probably two feet taller. So they would have been approximately eight feet tall if they had been standing. Wow. Really big, you know, broad shoulders, mm -hmm. white shining robes. They didn't have wings. Mm. Um, just really big men, again, like eight feet tall, long hair. Mm -hmm. And they had their hands. They, they were identical in appearance, like, like they could be identical twins. And they had their hands from each side, you know, the one from the driver's side like this, the one from the passenger side like that, in the crevice where I was flat. That's where they had their hands on me like that. And so I just watched it all from above and the emergency workers were coming and um, eight people came and then nine and 10 came in the wrong door. Everybody else came in the front door. Number nine and 10 came in the wrong door, the back door. And it's a little detail, mm -hmm. but it was a detail I remembered and I was able to retell and recount to the volunteer fire department at like a year later. Wow. And I was able to ask them in front of everybody. I pointed out to two people who came in the back door, a red-haired lady and an older guy and I said, Everybody else came in the front. Why did you come in the back? It was a real simple reason, but the whole thing was, if I'm laying under the trunk with no heart, there's no, no pulse, way you could have known that. I couldn't have seen that, except unless my spirit was up in the ceiling watching right. from above. And right. so she got this lady, Shannon Celia. She gets down between the angels. She's feeling around for a pulse. Um, she asked them what my name was. Mm -hmm. They said Bruce Vanetta. She began to pat me in the face and say, Bruce Vanetta, open your eyes. And it, it, from my view in the ceiling, it, it looked like everybody just kind of turned their head and looked at her like, you know, like she was crazy. Mm -hmm. And uh, she just kept getting louder and saying, open your eyes. And all of a sudden, my spirit came back into my body. I found out later um, she was a two-month-old baby Christian. Oh, wow. And she was praying me back right. to life. And her Amen. act of faith was saying, open your eyes. That was her step of faith. And she was doing this. And so she prayed me back to life. My spirit came back into my body. As soon as my spirit came back in my body, my heart started again. Mm -hmm. She could feel just a very, very weak pulse right here. Mm -hmm. And uh, it hurt so bad that, I mean, the pain was immense. So I closed my eyes to get away from the pain. As soon as I did, the pulse went away and my heart stopped again. My spirit left my body again, went up to the roof. But this time there was a tunnel off at about a 45 degree angle with light on the end. Mm -hmm. And I started going towards the light. She called me back to life again, went back and forth twice. And that's when God spoke to me. And he said, "If very simple, short, sweet. He said, if you want to live, you're going to have to fight. And it's going to be a hard fight. Mm -hmm. And it hurt too bad. So I said no. I shut my eyes. The third time, I started going towards the light in the tunnel. Mm -hmm. And she prayed me back to life that third time. And then said, as soon as I opened my eyes, she said, uh, Mr., what do you have to fight for? Mm -hmm. you know, do you have a wife? Do you have kids? You're on the verge of life and death. If you don't fight, you're going to die. And I realized, I knew that God had just spoken to me and given me the chance, right. given me the choice. Right, and I right. said no. But now she picked up where he left off, kind of reiterated what he said. And she said, what do you have to fight for? Do you have a wife? Do you have kids? And I'm now you thought about it. Now I thought about it, right, remembered right. that I was married, remembered that I had four right. children. I thought, oh, that's right. They need me, so mm. I'll keep my eyes open. I'll, I'll put up with the pain. Sure. So that's what happened. I uh, hung in there, and God did whatever he did with the angels. And that lady prayed me back to life. I get med flighted to our state's largest trauma center, wow. where they found that spleen had took a hit, pancreas had took a hit vertebrae were broken, one rib, actually I think two ribs, and uh, the, you know, pancreas is really bad, right. but the other, and the arteries, five places major arteries are suffered. Doctors make the statement, make yeah. the claim that I'm the only person they could find in the world that's had, yeah. that's lived with five major arteries suffered, five places. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that was miraculous in itself, and then the intestines, and that's, 
Gus. You know where Bruce Carlson comes in too. Yes. Now, b but before we go into that, I want to mention that you wrote about this incredible testimony. Yeah, a couple books. And you wrote, so I want to show them because, yeah. of course, this is only a half an hour show, but this goes into some yeah. great detail. Lots of details. And it's just uh, plus some teaching too. Yes, a, a lot of teaching, and we'll talk about that. But this one is called a Mir a miraculous life. True story of supernatural encounters with God. So I'm going to hold it up. Yeah, and there are about 43 miracle testimonies in that book, other than mine. If people like to read about miracle testimonies, you know, and it's showing what is God doing today in the world. That's a great book. That for is that. A great. And then this other one is Saved by Angels, to share God, t uh, how God talks to ev to everyday people. I should put my glasses on, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They're, they're really wonderful books. And this one is like a Bible study journal. Yeah, there's a spot we put spot. in the, the revised edition. That yes. was actually a, a Christian bestseller. And they, when they revised it, they put it places where you can actually kind of journal yourself after in each yes. chapter. And what is God saying to you after you read that chapter? It's there's a, actually a DVD video, video curriculum that goes with that that uh, people can buy. And so there's churches doing small group video curriculum yes. uh, using that as a Bible study, or people do it as individuals as well. Wow. So getting back to your story, so you were in the hospital, of course, mm -hmm. with your chances were very slim to yeah, none. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, in another part of the country, mm -hmm. God speaks to you, Bruce Carlson. And yeah. what happened then? Well, I barely knew Bruce. I had met him for maybe a half hour, months ahead of time when he came to visit New York for our new pastor, a young man, 30 years old. And our senior senior pastor retired so Bruce came in and uh, he dislocated a shoulder during a youth uh, event we had 400 young people on the church grounds there and so they brought him to me because I had been traveling as a healing evangelist so several of us prayed for him and he was instantly healed to all of our surprise we actually all took a step back he said it's 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 fixed it's gone so that was a little connection we had months before the actual mm -hmm. accident so all those months go by, and um, uh, I forget how many months it was exactly, but we get a phone call from the church saying there has been a severe accident for Bruce Vanetta. So I, at that point, I just thought the poor guy, I, had, I didn't know him. I thought, boy, that's terrible. You know, I didn't think any more about it. And you send up a few prayers, and, mm -hmm. but I don't, really don't know him. And so I'm waking up one morning, uh, early in the morning, 6 a.m., and I just have this sense, I don't know if you could call it a God whisper or what you would term it, go to Wisconsin and pray for Bruce Fanata. Mm -hmm. So and when we finally got up, I said to my wife, I must be hearing things. Right. I think I heard God say, go to Wisconsin and pray for Bruce Fanata. And uh, I thought, you know what? That's a $900 plane ticket. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> <laughs> he has a, a, a large church and a bunch of elders. No, I must have heard God wrong. Mm. So I sort of blew it off. Mm -hmm. The next morning, the same thing. Same mm -hmm. time, same place. Go and pray for Bruce Venata. And uh, so now I knew it was a matter of obedience mm -hmm. or disobedience. So I thought, you know, okay, I'm supposed to go. Mm -hmm. So I went knowing something would have to happen. Why would God go through all of this right, right, to go right. for no reason? And a bunch of stuff happened out there. They had a, an event going on to raise money for all those hospital bills. I met a bunch of people, mm -hmm. went to the hospital, brought a guitar, we sang some songs. And then uh, finally, I mean, he looked like a, a refugee from a concentration camp. Mm -hmm. can, if you can imagine, uh, 124 pounds mm -hmm. when his normal, normal weight was 185, something wow. like that. So, um, and as you mentioned, I just, you know, I prayed for him. And he, I don't, when I pray for people, I don't feel anything. But he felt like electricity went through him. Mm -hmm. And uh, he said to the people in the room, I just feel like a snake unraveled in my belly. Mm -hmm. So we're all just, you know, again, taken aback, knowing what was missing. And sure. that's what he feels. So they did retest him, and he had 9 to 11 feet. Praise which, God. Which don't regenerate. They don't. Creative miracle. Yeah, that it's a creative miracle. So. Now, now, Bruce, let me ask you this. Had God spoken to you in this kind of way before? Uh, not this clear and such a dramatic thing, you know. I, you know, once in a while I'll hear the voice of God, and but in a ministry basis for me, it's more just the teaching, preaching, and then pray for the people. Occasionally, I'll get what they call a word of knowledge, mm -hmm. but this mm -hmm. really was like a, a word of knowledge with a rhema 
punctuation mark on a go and pray right. for him. And in hindsight, now I know why. God could have picked anyone and said go, but he wanted to hook us up um, in ministry together. Right. I believe that's the reason he asked me to do it. He knew I was coming to my retirement. <laughs> and he's, he said, he no, said no, 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 he wasn't finished I'm with you. Keep running the race. Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Now, in your ministry as well, um, y you are uh, like a worship leader. Yeah, worship leader. Worship leader, and you've um, I've seen you preach, mm -hmm. and you do a fantastic job. And um, you, I, I want to hold up a couple of DVDs here. I'm sorry, CDs, CDs. CDs. Bruce Carlson. Yeah, and dust. that's a uh, secular music. Secular which, music, uh, but it's but it's very nice and mm -hmm. nice uh, love stories and it's sweet I guess stories. You call it folk Americana. Folk Americana, yeah. but uh, this one is uh, praise praise in the city. Praise in the city, praise and uh, I'm hoping it's going to be Las Cruces. You know, <laughs> I am too. In fact, I have a little bit of a testimony with your song. You know. Uh, there's no coincidence, but you and I happen to be neighbors, so yeah, we, which we don't know. We we go up up the mountain mm -hmm. to go home, and uh, I was shopping. I was uh, going up the mountain, and I had like a cramp in my leg. But I was listening to your CD, mm -hmm. and I was focusing on the praise and, and worship yeah. song. Immediately, it left. So it I'm left. like, praise <laughs> God, <laughs> praise yeah. God. So back to this incredible testimony. What did the doctors? I mean, how could they explain that? You, you, your intestines grew. Yeah, there is no explanation. In fact, there's been multiple television shows. Uh, I think the one that focused on one of the one of the ones that focused on the most was a, a History Channel show, and they had doctors that they interviewed and looked at the before and after CAT scans and X-rays and MRIs and doctor reports and examined all the stuff. Mm -hmm. And there is no explanation. Uh, small intestine does not grow back. Uh, there's proof. I mean, there's. There's so much documentation. Again, the, the written medical reports, they knew exactly the centimeter, the two pieces they saved and sewed back together, which was only about this much. And then all of a sudden I end up with nine to 11 feet. Again, they even opened me up the fifth operation. Mm -hmm. After he prayed for me, it was after my fourth operation. The fifth operation, they opened me up to remove a rib that never grew back, my gallbladder that was damaged because of all the months of intravenous feeding, mm -hmm. some scar tissue, some adhesion, some different things. And when they opened me up and they got to visually now see all these intestines that had come out of nowhere, I mean, you just can't, it can't be denied. And uh, people don't live, they, from what I found, from what I've been told, from what I've researched, they, they used to do small intestine transplants, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but people never live, so they quit yeah. doing them basically. Wow, There's one hospital left in the, in the world, or in the country anyway, in Pennsylvania that still does them, but the people don't live more than a year usually. Okay. You know, another amazing part mm -hmm. of this, not mention that often, but in the New York subway system, if someone's yeah. crushed by a subway car yes. and they're under that pressure, sure. they immediately go to find a cell phone where the person under the car can talk to their yes. relatives because mm -hmm. as soon as the pressure comes off, they die. Mm -hmm. And that's they another don't. amazing part of this that when that thing was jacked up, typically a person, that's that's the end. You know? Wow. And, and it wasn't very long, it was just a few minutes after it jacked up off me that I bled out. And unfortunately, our, our show is only half an hour, so we're going to have you for part two. Okay. Uh, so you could tell us um, why do you think God saved you? But we have a few minutes left, yeah. and you, both of you, have your evangelists. And so I wonder if you can speak to our audience about sure. uh, Jesus, how well, to get him into our life. Yeah, well, I just want to say this, that I think the reason why God saved me is the show, because of my background, because of my um, past and history of you know, drug and alcohol abuse because of the way I lived, all the bad choices and decisions I made. I believe that God saved me to show that we don't earn it, that it's free. It's a free gift, that it's mercy and grace. Mercy means not getting the punishment we deserve. Grace means getting the blessings that we don't deserve. And so I think by God saving me, it's, it's a sign of His mercy and His grace. It's like setting the bar so low that him saying, you know, if I do it for him, I'd do it for anyone. And I believe that's what the Bible says to us, that he loves us, not because we deserve it, not because we earn it, but just simply because he loves us, we're his children, we're his sons and daughters. So for anybody listening to this episode, I'd say to you that you are God's son, you are God's daughter, he loves you, he wants to have a relationship with you. And uh, going to church is not the same as relationship. Uh, trying to be a good person is not the same as relationship. Relationship is having daily intimacy with the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, the one who loves you more than you can ever imagine, who wants to spend time with you and communicate with you. 
and just pour out his love on you. And when we accept him into our heart as our Lord and Savior, what we're really doing is saying, I'm accepting you into, I want to come into relationship with intimacy with you. And that's, that's mm -hmm. what it's all about. Yeah, I would say to anyone listening, um, when you look into the mirror, you're looking at your earth suit. That's what I call it. This is my 68-year-old Caucasian earth suit. <laughs> but the real me is a spirit within my body. When Jesus died on the cross, it says he gave up his spirit. And so when we, uh, when we die, our spirit will leave our body. And so God provides a way for our sin to be taken away uh, before that happens. And, uh, so you either die with your sin or you die without your sin. And so Jesus comes to uh, wash away our sin. Christianity is a blood theology. It's not a works theology. The idea isn't what should I do to get to heaven. The idea is who do I receive to have the gift of heaven and a purpose in this life. So just encourage everyone. Um, you know, there's head belief where you just believe the stuff in your head. That's not saving faith. And it's, unfortunately, a lot of people have head knowledge. Maybe you've heard the little quip. Uh, you hear about the man who missed heaven by 17 inches. Mm -hmm. So he had all the answers intellectually, but he did not have a relationship, had never really received Jesus into his spirit. I understand there was a man who had the whole book of Mark memorized, and it was a Broadway, off-Broadway play in New York City. So you can have the whole New Testament memorized and still not know Jesus. Because the issue is about sin. See, the issue, is what separates us from God is sin. And what can, all, think of all the songs. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It, there is a fountain filled with blood. So Christianity it's, is a blood theology. It's the blood thing. And um, so Jesus shed it, shed his blood. And uh, he's the, he is the way, the, the truth, truth, and the and life. life. Amen. That's yeah. wonderful. Well, thank you so much for being on our program. <laughs> And thank you, my viewing audience, for being here today. If you'd like more information, please contact me at mariagoldstein7 at gmail.com. You can call me at 877-991-4800. Check out my voicemail, www.voicesinthewildernesstv. Until next time, I wish you good health, success, and spiritual growth. God loves you, and so do we. <laughs> This is a call for salvation. If you do not know Jesus, this is a call for salvation. The call for salvation, respond to the call for salvation. If you don't know the Savior, this is his presentation. It's been 2,000 years that have passed, you see, that Jesus died on the cross for us, laid his life down on Calvary. Jesus Christ, the begotten Son, all the Father Creator.